wonderful. Thank you to you both. But those were great opening remarks. So the next uh, presenter is going to be Drew and Mike, and they're going to talk about planning stuff. <laughs> All right. So I'll do my best to get us uh, back on schedule. So um, are there any questions? <laughs> All right. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to bring you some updates on what we got going on in planning, and, um, and I will put out a shameless plug. Um, you know, if you want to be part of the uh, two-time gold-winning uh, SEC championship, uh, we do have a uh, EPM1 uh, currently posted, so come join the team. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to I touch base on our long-range transportation plan. Uh, Mike's going to try to open the box on the, um, on the um, travel demand model, and then I'll give you a few uh, updates on Gateway. And so uh, let's dive right into um, to our long-range transportation plan, uh, innovation in motion. So we have been uh, at this project for about, let me find my clicker. Do I have a clicker? Maybe we'll get it. So, um, so basically, the plan is a policy-based plan, so we're not specifically listing projects in the long-range transportation plan. Um, we did a whole lot of stakeholder involvement, so if you talked with um, a member of JMT or our planning staff on the long-range transportation plan, raise your hand because we reached out to every division, so hopefully a few folks. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Bridge is definitely represented. It just doesn't oh, it's look this like it. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. There. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and, um, and then basically included um, all elements of transportation. So when we think about how the plan is going to be used, um, we, hope it's, uh, we hope it's not going to be a document that just sits on the, sits on the, um, on the shelf. Uh, the last plan was done in 2012. It was uh, very informative, but we want this to be more interactive. We want it to be, um, it's going to have a, a, a better web presence, and we're hopefully that, uh, that folks could dive into this thing and really let it um, strategically influence where you and your divisions are going with, um, with long-range planning. Uh, also for the public, uh, we, we, um, the web presence is going to create some transparency. It's going to um, educate uh, the public on all of the awesome innovations that, uh, that Dell Dot is doing. So uh, we did do a lot of outreach, even though nobody raised their hand except for Jason. Um, so I just want to assure you that we did. <laughs> we collaborated with all the divisions um, and then uh, did, a, did a pretty extensive public outreach as well. We had surveys. Uh, we engaged over 1,100 folks. Uh, at different events and um, um, activities, you know, we kind of went out where the people were to try to uh, to get those uh, to get those public inputs uh, to help formulate and shape the plan. So, what is the plan? So, we've got ten goals to ensure that we are providing excellence in transportation. You can see them listed there on the left side. And, um, and, and they're basically to ensure, you know, when we think about our mission state and every trip, every mode, every dollar, every one, um, these, these goals will help ensure that. We then applied those goals to eight transportation elements. And so uh, we, we basically covered um, every transportation element that Del Dot is responsible for. So this, these align very closely with all of our um, projects and, um, and program areas. And, and so many of you may not get into all of those, uh, all those aspects, but by Delaware code, Del Dot is responsible to ensure that all of these areas function within the state. So we took each one of those transportation elements and we did a deep dive into um, in each one of them and we looked at when we think about this plan, you know, a 20 year plan, a vision, um, what is going to be influencing the way that we do businesses? What are the challenges? What are the constraints? Um, Rob mentioned, you know, our issues with, um, with pedestrian safety. You know, a lot of challenges there, um, but also a lot of opportunity there. Uh, we, um, we, we think about technology and, the, and the, the work that the TMC is doing to, to better leverage the, um, I'm not too sure what's above a gig, uh, um, but... Uh, 
terabyte and even beyond that of data that we're, uh, that we're assembling each and every day, 24-7 uh, data collection. How can we better leverage that to be able to make better decisions? Um, uh, partnerships, we think about uh, DTC and, and trying to improve that, uh, that system with more partnerships. Um, and then we do identify just strategic uh, strategies and action items for each of those. So, um, so we'll dive a little bit uh, into each one of those. So we look at planning and land use. Uh, the goal here is to, is to integrate that um, more comprehensively. We have changed the way that we're working with the MPOs. Uh, so we are, um, we're, we're trying to get more substantive uh, transportation planning um, studies from those organizations. We're integrating land use. Um, we're actually integrating um, um, planning and environmental linkage now into all of our all of our open ends, all of our all of our contracts for uh, for planning studies. Uh, we're also going to be um, strengthening our TID program. So who's familiar with the TID? That acronym. So it's a transportation improvement district. Again, a comprehensive. Um, land use and transportation planning vehicle where we partner with the local land use agency uh, to identify a, um, a geographic area where they tell us exactly how it's going to grow up. Um, they rub the crystal ball and they, they tell us how it's going to grow up. Then we can then say how the transportation system needs to grow up and, and budget and plan for that through the um, land use coordination. When we think about roads and bridges, um, and other assets. This is really kind of maintaining what we have. Um, uh, enhanced asset management, um, you know, more involvement or, or more thought into uh, climate impacts and how that's going to influence the systems. Um, it's utilizing performance measures to, to better allocate resources. So, so let the data drive where the money is going to be invested. And, um, and identifying and planning for future uh, roadway widening. So we've introduced this new element of corridor strategies, um, worked closely with Rob and, and kind of his, uh, his brainchild here of identifying uh, strategies for, even though we're not project specific, we, we, we looked at, at roads um, throughout the state and said, is this a road that we just need to maintain? Is this a road that needs some enhancement, maybe some multimodal components added to it, or is this a road that we really need to be thinking about and setting up for future widening based on local land use trends and, and those things? So we have, um, we've identified those corridors are going to be included in the plan. So we have uh, the, the um, basically the three strategy levels, and then we also have the corridor capacity preservation uh, program, which protects um, uh, US 13, 113, and SR1, and 48 up in Newcastle uh, for, um, so that we can um, plan for the future. Hey, Pam. What's up? Um, I, <clears throat> oh, oh, sorry. All the consultants, if you can just let your offices know that the YouTube's up, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Sorry. That was a PSA from Pam. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so um, we, talk, we think about traffic and, um, and all the great work that the TMC has done uh, with innovation. They've really been leaders within our department, and they continue to be leaders. And so um, really what we're looking to do is, is just to continue that innovation, um, look for better ways to deploy, better ways to harness that data, and better ways to allow it to uh, influence our decision making. Um, always, um, it's... it's the goals here um, closely align with the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, so that's one of the things that, that this plan does is, it's, is it doesn't create new strategies and new things. It, it, it absorbs a lot of the great work that we've already done. And so uh, for when we think about traffic and system management, obviously the Strategic Highway Safety Plan is, uh, is, is very much um, driving that, um, the actions and the, and the things that we do. Um, also, when we think about the bicycle transportation, we recently published the blueprint for um, bicycle-friendly Delaware. So again, a strategic plan that is absorbed into, um, into this uh, long-range transportation plan. And, and we're really looking to you know, maintain our high level of, of ranking within the um, uh, bicycle-friendly um, rankings. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're really looking for enhanced mapping to help us better assess where those gaps are, uh, where, where the missing links are, and we think mapping is a, is a great way to go. And then, um, 
and then this idea of, of bicycle stress level has been introduced here. And so that is, that is looking at all of the measures uh, on a particular roadway segment, shoulder width, speeds, volumes, to, to determine um, how stressful it is to ride a bike in that environment. And so, um, so we've got those mapped out and, and uh, we're, we're excited about those. Um, pedestrian, and so this is, uh, Rob talked a little bit about our, our current state of the state, it's not good. And so it's, it's just making a commitment to improve our pedestrian safety on the system, focus on ADA compliance, connecting the system and providing a more safe environment for our pedestrians. Uh, when we think about freight, uh, we think about our port expansion and the opportunities that we have with Golf Tainer coming in. We think about the Delmarva Central Railroad uh, coming in and really proactively wanting to uh, enhance uh, freight movement within our, um, uh, within our state. Uh, our big focus here, again, it's absorbing our, our uh, Delmarva freight plan, but it's also uh, focused in the next couple years on these final mile connections, just looking at on-time delivery. Um, you know, if you order something from Amazon and you get it in three days, you're mad, right? Um, and it's very difficult to, to meet the expectation of those, um, those deliveries. And, uh, and so we're really focused on, on freight and, um, and how we can better move freight within Delaware. Aeronautics, um, many of you may not know that uh, economic, total economic impact of aviation in Delaware is over $1 billion. And so we've got a lot of opportunities with air cargo, uh, with, um, with MROs, the maintenance, rehabilitation, and overhaul of facilities within our state uh, can be a real economic generator, and we are tasked to make sure that that happens. When we think about public transportation, we're thinking about more um, um, networking with, with more operators, um, um, vehicle enhancements, we've got natural gas, we've got all electric vehicles, and now we're even uh, moving into autonomous uh, public transportation. So a lot of great things happening, happening there. Um, part three of, our, of the plan talks about um, uh, how we're going to continue to evolve in technology and innovation. And, uh, and there's a lot of great tools and things, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about it over the next couple of days. Um, about how we're leveraging uh, all kinds of technology to help us better, um, uh, better plan and, and better communicate with our customers. All right, so where are we? Uh, we've done a whole lot of work, and so we're uh, basically at the finish line. We've gonna, um, we're going to publish a draft in the, next, um, in, in the next month or so, and then, uh, and then we'll move to adoption sometime in the spring of 19. And so we're pretty excited about it. Again, it's going to have a web uh, presence. The idea is that this thing is not going to sit on the shelf, that we're going to constantly be looking at this, looking at new innovations, and, and doing um, annual updates to the plan. And so you can find the plan at uh, plandel.gov. And so that's not anywhere on any of the slides, but plan.del.gov. I'm going to ask Mike to come up, and, uh, and he's going to, I'm going to save the questions till the end. And Mike is going to uh, talk a little bit about that black box called the travel demand model. Uh, just the big. Okay. Uh, the couple green, the big green one. Big green. Okay. Yeah. Big Thank green. you. <laughs> uh, a couple slides on our travel model. Uh, some updates that we, we have in store for 2019. Uh, no equations. No tests. Um, <clears throat> I think generally speaking, uh, fits well with with Rob and Drew's theme about uh, improved business practices. Um, we're, we're here to uh, basically state that we, we understand clearly and loudly uh, what, what we've heard over the past year or two in terms of turnaround time and things like that. So uh, we're, we're here to talk about some of the, the improvements that we're thinking about. Uh, just, to, just a comment on context, um, uh, why we have to use this, this modeling tool. Uh, so you know we're the 49th smallest state, uh, but we're, we're actually in the top 20 in terms of total road mileage. Um, we're actually one of four states with 90% or, or more of the road system, so we have a lot of responsibility. Uh, we, we add about 11,000 dwelling units a year, uh, half in Sussex, um, and that growth rate, while we, just to put that in context, is we're actually the eighth fastest growing state in the past 10 years. And the first three years of that decade was the recession. So if you, if you kind of account for the recession, we're still the eighth fastest state in terms of uh, percentage increase in the country. So uh, what that means is uh, we have a lot of 
responsibility for a system that is increasingly under a lot of pressure uh, due to growth, and, and there's lots of reasons uh, why growth is a very good thing. Uh, we'll save that for a different presentation. Um, but uh, the main message is this, this travel modeling tool is, is a really good way to, to get a sense, uh, a better sense of the understanding of, of, of how all this gross pressure uh, affects different roads in different rates, uh, in different locations through, throughout the state. So uh, our, our, just a couple quick details uh, on our travel model. Uh, we, we actually uh, uh, simulate the entire uh, Delmarva Peninsula, so our three counties plus uh, the, the nine counties of, of Maryland's Eastern Shore in, in one model. So uh, we're, we're accounting for all of the land use activities, uh, the seasonal flows, uh, all of the things that comprise the different layers and levels of, of traffic. Uh, we're, we're trying to put that into our uh, information tool to help drive decisions on, on lots of projects. Um, one, one thing that uh, I, I kind of debate with Drew about is that faster PCs don't always mean faster turnaround times. Uh, what it tends to mean is more runs because you have more questions and that actually takes more time in, in some instances. So uh, we're trying to be as responsive as possible, take advantage of and leverage all of the technical advances on hardware, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, use that hardware uh, to our own advantage in terms of having more complicated, more comprehensive uh, models. Uh, we, we have noticed a big increase in uh, workload over the past 18 months, uh, just in terms of, of uh, requests from, uh, from you guys, from consultants, from the MPOs. Uh, so, so all of these projects uh, that we're talking about uh, speeding up, that, that's great, but um, you know, we basically have one person doing most of the modeling. And uh, so what I've decided to do with, with uh, Drew's concurrence is get out of the modeling business <coughs> and try to give you guys more predictability. And uh, one way of doing that is to have more resources. So uh, our, our section in Delta Regional Systems uh, still manages and maintains the modeling, uh, but we're using consultant resources uh, more than ever. And we also have uh, two students up at U of D through Dr. Lee uh, who are providing over 1,000 hours each of, of modeling support. So it's, it's really good experience for them, uh, really good, uh, if efficient uh, help for us. Uh, we're also going to have a, a, um, a request form uh, on the Design Resource Center webpage in a couple weeks. Uh, this, this form will prompt you to provide some information about your project, uh, the nature of the project, what exactly you're looking for. <clears throat> this will help us uh, understand the type of forecast that you need and um, help us prioritize uh, among all the different uh, requests that we're, we're getting. Um, we're, we're also going to uh, uh, meet with the, the requesters uh, much more often. So this will be on the, uh, the website uh, within a few uh, weeks. Uh, we're going to publicize exactly when in the weekly newsletter. Um, in addition to myself, uh, we have Mr. Stephen Pondo Voigt uh, of Whitman, uh, who is an on-site person. Uh, he'll be in, the, in uh, Del Dot uh, at least once a week, uh, helping with project coordination and, and training for, for planning staff. Uh, he is also one of those aforementioned uh, Dr. Lee students. So the, the full circle has occurred where uh, someone we, we had as an intern or a part-time helper uh, through U of D is actually now integrated with, within our process. So the main goal is, is more standardized turnaround times uh, for different types of, of projects, whether they be uh, design forecasts or, or, or NEPA Carter study forecasts or, or something like that. So we'll, we'll work to uh, uh, standardize those times uh, as, as we go. Uh, improve project tracking. Um, you know, rather than just sort of me prioritizing based on the urgency of, of the latest email, uh, we're, we're approaching this in a standardized way. You know, it seems kind of common sense, but um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the big increase 
in, in workload kind of came out of the blue as my role was shifting a little bit. So uh, we're, we're keeping an eye on the dots on the radar much, much better. Um, on the technical side, uh, we actually have a way of, of modeling tax parcels. That's a very, very high resolution. Uh, we're accounting for all of the individual uh, housing units and uh, employment locations. So it gives us a very rich uh, set of data to, to help uh, inform project decisions. Um, and uh, this is a Mark Lutz idea from a year or two ago. Uh, we're gonna put out a guidebook this year to, to help you understand what the, the model can do from your perspective uh, and, and help you understand what to ask for uh, so that we don't spend a lot of time sort of spinning wheels. Uh, but there are certain types of information uh, that, that could inform uh, your, your project and will we'll help, uh, the, this guidebook will, will, will help summarize that in, in an easy to read way. Uh, the last thing is uh, we, we have a way of, of doing 3D simulations that uh, merges the travel model with vSIM, with uh, SketchUp 3D projects, pulls all that with, with drone footage uh, into uh, 3DS Max, which is a 3D software. So, so this picture here uh, is, is actually a photorealistic uh, simulation of the Zor Road project uh, about a year ago. So it, it adds things like clouds and shadows and lighting, uh, um, <clears throat> improves street signing. So it's a much more realistic way of, uh, of um, understanding the project impact uh, from the site context and the community context. So this helps us on the, the traffic forecast end, but it, it could help you from a, a public involvement per perspective. So the main message is keep in touch. Uh, if you have a problem, let me know, let Stephen know, and we will, we will uh, address as best we can. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, the main, the main goal is, is that we want to provide you better, uh, better service, and, and working with Mike, I think we've got some great, uh, great things coming your way as far as the travel demand model. I just want to give a couple, a couple updates on the Gateway. So uh, who, who knows who has been on Gateway? So that's awesome, that's great. Um, even our chief engineer uh, um, knows <laughs> where Gateway is. So this was a game we were playing, and so the, uh, the, the question you were trying to answer was Gateway, that was the answer. And so somebody drew this, and literally within like five seconds, Rob yells out Gateway, because that's where the icon is on your screen. So, um, so uh, that's a great penetration. So uh, basically, this is a, um, it's a web mapping portal. Um, we maintain it in the, in the um, division of planning. The goal is to bring up-to-date GIS information uh, and have it right at your fingertips so that you can make the best decision. Uh, basically, we're leveraging the first map uh, at, um, at DTI. So all of the data layers that we, um, that we generate we published a first map and then just draw that back into our, um, uh, into our ArcGIS online um, interface. And so we've had a couple of updates in 2018. Um, basically, these were a response from folks who said, hey, I'd really, like a, I'd really like some additional tools, some functionality. And so we added a maintenance road search number so you can type in the maintenance road. We have a community search box. Uh, we have a bridge number search box. And then uh, newly added, and so you're gonna love this one, is a bookmark. And so um, basically, you just click on the bookmark and whatever view you're in or whatever layers you have on, uh, you can then name that. You can have multiple bookmarks. You just click this button and you can recall them and it'll take you right to where you were uh, with, the, with the layers that you have toggled on. on. And so if you've got a certain um, um, you know, workflow that you use, say right of way, and you've got a certain things that you want to have on, uh, turn those on, get your view set up, and then bookmark it, and then go back to it uh, every time by clicking that, that box. Um, let's see, some new layers that we added. Uh, we, we, we have a more robust MPDES, so again, uh, my goal is to then link this. So we, so we have all the features, we have uh, quite a bit of data from the MPDES database, you know, and it has its own it has its own interface, its own portal, but this is kind of, this is a way to layer it on top of everything else here in Gateway. And the idea is that if you wanna dive deeper, 
Uh, my goal is to get some hyperlinks here that will launch you right into the NPDES interface. Uh, we added uh, wireless small cell uh, permits. So these are things that are going to be popping up in our right-of-way. Uh, it's going to be a concern for us, and so we need to know where they are. Uh, bicycle level of stress. This is something I touched base with on the I touched base on on the long range transportation plan. So this gives you an idea of 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 um, you know if you're designing a road, um, look at the stress level. If it's a if it's a major bike corridor, then this gives you some information to uh, to be able to decide how you're going to do. Um, thanks to our friends at Pannoni, we've we've just recently added Google Street View. So if you've been on recently, like in the last couple weeks, you'll see that there is a um, kind of a hybrid of Street View. I'll demonstrate that in just a, in just a bit. Also, uh, preliminary land use service. So these are like the developments that are that are coming down the road, and so they may not have made it into the development coordination pr formal process, but they're they're kind of at that at that first step where they go to the Office of State Planning Coordination uh, for agency comment. And so uh, so a great layer. You can see uh, all of our comments that DelDOT is making uh, and and how that might influence your projects. Um, coming in 19, we've got a couple of other things uh, that we're, that we're going to be adding, overhead sign structures, on-road signs, uh, intersection control, pavement marking types, rumble strips. These are all coming from our, um, our TSDM, which is our, our, um, our new management system that took the place of, um, of RIMS. And, and so this is data that we collected from our LIDAR project. So we, we collected all kinds of asset data, and so now we're getting that geo-enabled so that it can be at your fingertips and you can, you can take a look at those things. Um, let's see. Uh, updated Google imagery. So I've been working with, um, uh, with Todd to get updated Google Maps, and, uh, and I think we've made some headway on that, so you're going to see the latest and greatest coming to Gateway. So no more kind of having having Google Earth up and, and, and Gateway up, trying to find those latest imagery. It's going to be uh, on Gateway. Archive construction plans, it's a project that we're working on. Uh, grouped layers, uh, so this is, you know, the layer list is getting long, so we're trying to strategize about, about how, we might, um, how we might better group those. So maybe an environmental layer, maybe a right-of-way, um, uh, sub like a, like a file tree almost structure. And, uh, and so we'll be sending out probably a survey to try to try, try to get some feedback on on some different models and samples of that as we move forward in 19. Um, and then continued integration to the CTP project prioritization, just using the data to better make decisions. Um, just a little bit on our archive construction plans. Basically, we're tapping into OnBase, uh, which is the database that houses all of the metadata. Um, we're geo geolocating all of those projects, and then ultimately you just tap in and bring up a PDF of the plan. And so I'll ask my friends in the back to uh, to toggle me over to a, um, and I'll give you a little a little update. So I got a mouse that works. Yes, ma'am. All right, I should have signed in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is the, uh, a little bit of a demo. Um, if I can get a control minus, just to, just to shrink down the view just a little bit. Um, yep. Yeah, that's not working. Okay, that's okay. Um, so, so Street View, um, I'll, take, I'll take back over. So basically, uh, when we look at Street View, uh, this is an enhanced view, so you can see uh, what Pannoni did was drop the dot every... Um, 50 feet or so, and I'll try to get this to come up. Let me zoom in a little bit. So all of these dots represent a hyperlink to the map that then opens up another window that takes you to the street view. And I think we're, I'm not too sure whether we're running on the, um, I, I'm not too sure what we're running on, but it pops up a lot faster back in the office. And so there, there you have the street view, and so when you're, um, when you are um, working in Gateway, you can quickly, and, um, and typically the view is, the, the, there's, there's smaller boxes. Um, I also wanted to give you a, a look at the, um, uh, at the archive plan. So um, what will happen is there will be a series of, um, of, of lines on a map that we're able to click on. So archive plans, and then we will... Um, 
So we'll go to the archive plan and that'll tell you what contract number it is. We'll have a contract name. This is still under development. I'll try to get my mouse over here. And then ultimately what that will do is then launch you right into a PDF of the plans that you can, um, that you can have. So, so they'll, be, um, they'll be layered. So everything from contract number one to the latest contract, you know, if, if there's 10 contracts on a road, you can toggle through, you'll see the contract number, you'll see the name, and then you can make a decision on which archive plan you want to view. So all geo-enabled, um, so we think that that's going to be a great resource uh, for you to, um, uh, to utilize. And so with that, those are the, those are the big things for, uh, for 2019 that we're working on. And so um, with that, I'll just open it up to questions. So um, that's a good question. So what we have on on base up until um, you know anything historically like pre um, 1990 you know in the 90, early 2000s are all going to be the the redlined as built. Um, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd defer to Billy, I guess, on on how we you know how we're managing as built plans uh, moving forward with the newer type contracts. Hopefully. We'll be able. We'll be in a much better position to actually archive what was constructed when we go to the more electronic um, e-construction, where we'll be able to make the notes right on the plans, and hopefully that'll that'll migrate us into a more um, uh, a more accurate re reflection of what was built. Good question, though. Yes, ma'am. First off, uh, congratulations. This is amazing. Um, a quick question with respect to your layers. Is it possible that you'll have a utility layer included so that you know a, a, a project manager could open up a section of roadway and get a handle on what some of the existing utilities yeah, are? Yeah, that's, that uh, that's a great question. That would be a, a huge uh, benefit for us. Um, we have essentially uh, worked out a negotiation with one, um, with one utility company so far to share their, uh, their geo later layers with us, and so we're gonna continue to work, work with those. So Chesapeake Utilities tra Gas Transmission, so those are, are on the gateway, and, uh, and so we, we, we definitely want to enhance that utility layers and information. It's, it's hard, because they're, you know, they don't wanna give up what they have, you know, there's, there's liability risks, and so we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of language on the front end that you'll read, and it says basically, you know, you're, you know, proceed at your own risk uh, when, when you're looking at some of that data. Any other questions? All right, so that'll do it for me. Um, thank you for your time and have a, have a great workshop. Alrighty. Okay, um, so just FYI, YouTube is up and I just wanna um, make sure that, just make sure if you're at the satellite or the, uh, the satellite locations or um, at a consulting firm to make sure that you sign in um, so that you can get your PDHs. So next up we have um, Kyle and Mike from Pintoni. If you wanna come up, they're gonna be talking about some PEDS. And you're, yeah, so it's just forward on that button. All right, good morning everyone. Um, as Pam said, my name is Kyle Clevenger. Um, I work for Pannoni Associates and I'm here to give you guys an update on Del Dots US 13 pedestrian improvements project. Uh, before I get into this, I do wanna apologize in advance if I'm a little rusty. I'm coming off vacation last week. Um, and I actually went and visited the second deadliest state for pedestrians to prepare for today's pre presentation, which is Florida. Um, so just remember we could always be worse. Um, so my wife and I took my one-year-old daughter down, not to visit Mickey Mouse at Disney World, but to visit my wife's grandparents who live in the villages. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with the villages, but it's basically this humongous master plan community, over 100,000 people. Um, I haven't done my own independent research, but I'm assuming they don't have the same pedestrian safety issues as the rest of the state, uh, because everybody there just drives around on golf carts and golfs and plays bocce ball. Um, I never thought I'd be one for a retirement community, but it seems like a pretty, a pretty sweet gig. Um, 
So, you know, as you see Delaware here, we're, we're unfortunately ranked fifth. Um, this was from 2016. This is uh, pedestrian fatalities um, per capita. So not, not where we want to be. Um, I'm lucky that I made it out of Florida, you know, unscathed with all those elderly retirees driving around. Um, speaking of retirees, I'm sure many of you here know Mark Tudor. Um, <laughs> sorry to pile it on, Mark, but last time I gave this presentation was at the July, or uh, yeah, it was the July uh, Pedestrian Council meeting, and Mark Tudor kicked off the meeting. Uh, Mark was in very instrumental in getting this project initiated, getting the funding in place, um, kicking it off. So. Mark Tudor, um, I hope you're enjoying retirement. I know it's not golf and bocce ball, but I'm sure you'll get there someday. Um, so Mark kicked it off, then passed off to Mark Lutz, and Mark Lutz, he touched on the strategic highway safety plan update. Uh, Mark, I see this is on the agenda for tomorrow, so I'm not going to steal your thunder too much, but I want to hit on a couple of the um, pedestrian statistics slides. <coughs> Excuse me. So 2016, 2017, DelDOT did meet their goal of uh, a two, two per year reduction in combined fatalities and serious injuries. Um, so that's good news. I'm not sure what the 2018 numbers are yet, but there's obviously work to do to get to their goal of um, zero deaths. DelDOT has performed multiple pedestrian safety audits throughout the state. Uh, Pannoni has actually had the pleasure of working on five of those and we're currently in final design on four. Um, so real exciting stuff on the pedestrian safety front. And Mark also touched on uh, the median barriers uh, and fencing initiative that we're considering. Um, the idea here is to deter pedestrians from making mid-block crossings. And this is what my colleague Mike's going to come up and get more in depth on uh, once I finish up here. So um, Mark, um, if I can make a request for another Eagles chant this year, that'd be great. I know we didn't win the Super Bowl, but I think that should be an annual tradition. So. Um, so US 13 was one of those corridors that's uh, been audited uh, you know, for pedestrians. Several consultants, urban engineers, and Whitman have studied it in the past. And DelDOT brought Pannoni on board to expand on those um, studies, take another step, and create a master plan of improvements for the corridor, um, and then take it into final design. So for those of you who um, are not familiar with Pannoni, we are a full-service multidisciplinary engineering firm. Our transportation group in Newark, Delaware, we have over 25 highway traffic and bridge engineers. I'm your lead traffic engineer, and Mike is our lead highway engineer, and we're all um, working under the tutelage of Phil Porcy. I'm sure many of you know Phil. Uh, we hold several agreements with DelDOT, the PAR and pedestrian, or pedestrian access routes and pavement rehab contracts with Tom Nickel and Mike Beulah, and project development open end where we're now working with Jerry Lovell, Tom Brooks, and Pam. And I'm pretty sure Pam knows the road now uh, that we're talking about. So, um, so quick agenda. Uh, what I'm going to discuss. We're going to get into the why, just to you know, um, reinforce the pedestrian safety issue here in Delaware. I know we're all well aware of it. Uh, I'm going to go over progress on the 13 corridor, share a few visualization examples with you guys, and then I'm going to pass it off to Mike, who's going to get into the median treatments, um, touch on the education enforcement, and then follow up with QA and next steps. So I know we're all well aware of the pedestrian safety issue, us um, consultants and, and DelDOT employees. We live it every day. It's our jobs. Um, but it's also in the news. This is affecting real people. It's affecting real families. Uh, before our um, July pedestrian council meeting, there was an article in the paper. This is after a fatality on Kirkwood Highway. They uh, mentioned the US-13 project specifically in this article. And I believe Mark Lutz was interviewed for this. Um, so it's not just us. It's, it's affecting real people, and it's, and it's out in the public. Uh, and US 13 specifically has a notorious reputation. Uh, you can see on this uh, scrolling roll plan here, the red dots you see are pedestrian fatalities, yellows are injuries, and blue are those lucky enough to escape without serious injury. Um, from 20, 2007 to 2014, 20% of all traffic fatalities in the state of Delaware involved pedestrians. That number on the 13 corridor is 66%. So two out of every three traffic fatalities uh, involved a pedestrian. And that was the 10-year period from 2007 to 2016. Um, and to put that into greater context, that's a little over one in every eight pedestrian fatalities in the state occurred on this corridor. Um, as such, the project's currently ranked fourth on DelDOT's CTP uh, priority listing. So we originally presented this at the 2017 Pedestrian Council meeting. 
uh, and we discussed what, what the next steps were. This was when we first um, completed the conceptual design and our conceptual um, report. We talked about increasing CTP funding for construction, getting capital projects in construction by FY20, uh, getting the, the word out to the public, implementing a median fencing pilot program, and of course, the continued education and enforcement. Um, now to hit on each one of these goals, uh, getting the funding set up, we actually, uh, Del Dot stepped up to the plate and got 26 million in construction funding, um, above the 20 million. <clears throat> Capital projects and construction by FY20. Uh, last year, the Christina River Bridge Approach Project broke, broke ground, as well as the adjacent 76ers Field House. So that, uh, those projects are really transforming that area there by the Market Street, Walnut Street split. Uh, we now have what we're calling the 2019 Pavement Rehabilitation Project. This is from Bacon Boulevard, uh, Bolden, or I'm sorry, Bacon Avenue, Bolden Boulevard, up to about the 495 interchange area. Uh, this has been a really exciting project to work on. This actually started off as a traditional pave and rehab that Century is working with Mike Beulah on. Um, Del Dot, um, you know, they aden identified the opportunity to get all these much needed pedestrian safety improvements, piggyback it onto the pave and rehab, and utilize that expedited project delivery um, to get these improvements on the ground quicker. Um, so we've been using the recently adopted uh, Del Dot policy changes that Mr. McCleary discussed, uh, the, yeah, the updated right away verification DGMs and the um, acquisition plats. And it's been um, really exciting to be a part of, to see this um, you know, moving forward at a faster rate than you typically see. So we currently um, are in the right-of-way acquisition process. We've had um, just a huge, I mean, we have monthly meetings. Um, Tom Nickel and Mike Buell have been teaming up with PD North with Jerry and Tom Brooks and um, all the support, staff team support, Del Dot Traffic, JMT with the PAS reviews. Everybody's just been really accommodating to the accelerated schedule. Uh, it's been really fun to be a part of. So we're looking to PS&E this thing um, early this summer, late spring, and get it into construction by the end of the summer. Uh, following that project, we have what we're calling the 2020 PAR and Pave and Rehab project. Um, this is gonna essentially cover the rest of the corridor to the south. So this is gonna be from south of the US 40 split up to Bacon and Bolden. And we have two breakout contracts that we're gonna implement in advance of that. One will be focused on lighting improvements and the other will be on the median uh, treatments. And the idea here is that these projects should have minimal right away. They're gonna provide an, um, minimal right away impacts. They're gonna provide an immediate safety benefit, something that we can um, get out on the street quicker than um, the, the PAR and pavement rehab project, which will come second. So um, the, the PAR and pavement project, we have over 100 parcels being impacted. We've already begun coordination with development coordination. Um, we're working towards semifinal plans this summer, final plans a year from now, and then the construction for that section will be pending the I-95 rehabilitation project. Uh, public workshops, we've presented this now to pedestrian council meetings, uh, presented this to the Wilmapco non-motorized non transportation working group, and we've reached out to several legislators, and we'll be coming out with the virtual online workshops um, for the individual contracts as construction nears. And we're also working towards the medium fencing pilot program, which Mike will touch on, and always the continued education and enforcement. So here's a schematic of the corridor. Um, you can see that in green, sorry, I can't point, but in green um, near the 13 logo, that's our 2019 pavement rehab section where you'll see um, the improvements being installed this summer. The 2020 is that long blue section that's gonna follow up with the rest of it. Um, the green up north by the Walnut Street Market Street split is a CRBA project. Just south of that, Bridge 686, there's uh, plans to rehabilitate that bridge. So what we're left with is a couple of future CTP projects um, between, four, basically to get a par from Hessler Boulevard there near, near the DMV, um, up to Bridge 686. And then also down at US 40 in Wilton, we're gonna be looking at uh, potential pedestrian overpasses or a tunnel um, to help with that pedestrian movement there near the railroad. <clears throat> Some of our recommended improvements are pretty typical of your pedestrian safety projects. Uh, I'm going to run through these real quick. Signalized crosswalks. Pre-2007, there was only four crossings. That's what you see in green. So we had one on each end of the corridor and then um, two in the middle. So it's four crossings on a seven-mile corridor. Since 2007, uh, Del Dot's done a great job. They've installed nine additional crossing locations. So we have 13 now. Um, a lot of these came out of the 2009 pedestrian safety study that was on the southern end of the corridor uh, between the 40 split and 273. 
And here's what we have proposed through our projects. We have three brand new signals turning in green, one of which is um, New Sweden Street, the CRBA project. And we'll be modifying nine existing signals to provide additional crosswalks. So in the end, we're going from four crossing locations to 21. So uh, you know, a huge overhaul in the corridor. And that's really what's key to preventing these mid-block um, you know, mid crossing um, crashes is providing new crossing opportunities. So a couple of the new signals, one will be at Quigley Boulevard. This is just south of 273. Um, essentially, there's uh, this whole area on the um, west side of th US 13 was developed. There's a new Chipotle, a Panda Express. There's the Wawa that's been there for a few years. The Dutch Inn Motel is being redeveloped. There'll be, a, I believe, a Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, and some retail. So naturally, a big pedestrian generator. We looked at closing this uh, median opening off to provide the, the pedestrian fencing, but you're gonna then route traffic up to the 273 intersection, which is already over capacity. Not really uh, feasible, so we'll be installing a signal at this location, which is actually warranted um, for the left turns um, into that site. Our other new signal that you'll see going in that 2019 pave and rehab is at Grace Lawn Memorial Park. This is just north of 295. Um, currently, there's about a mile and a half between existing crossings. And as you can see, there's several transit stops there. Pretty heavy ridership with the um, Health and Social Services campus. So this is crucial to provide another crossing location for um, transit users. Corridor lighting. Uh, existing, we have lighting at the three interchanges. And then south of 273, that was installed following the 2009 pedestrian safety study. And where we're filling in the gaps is shown in green. Uh, the 2019 pavement rehab, we already have um, final lighting plans ready to go. We've already um, submitted preliminary lighting plans for the rest of the corridor. We've met with DRBA and FAA. Um, yes? A laser? Ah, gotcha. It says danger. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, I went backwards. There we go. Okay, great. Thanks, man. Yeah, so in greens are filling in the gaps. We've um, We've been coordinating with, as I said, DRBA, FAA for the landing improvements near the airport. So we've got a good start on all of that. Um, so in the end, this whole entire corridor will be lit. Lighting is one of the most effective safety countermeasures for pedestrian safety. Um, the lighting that was installed south of 273, we looked at the four years prior to installation and four years after. The number of nighttime crashes went from eight down to two. So um, it's very promising. And then you have your typical PAR improvements, that's curb ramp upgrades, uh, providing missing sidewalk lengths, there's a ton of those, and reconsolidation or consolidation and relocation of transit stops. Um, again, what's, what you see in orange is your, your areas where you have existing PAR networks established, and in blue is where we're filling in the gaps, so a lot of gaps to fill in. Enhanced pavement signing and striping, you'll see throughout the whole corridor once we're done with the pavement rehabs. And now I'll share a couple sample visualization examples that kind of ties all of this in together. This is the Grace Lawn signal. This is an existing plan view. And here you'll see with the addition of new sidewalks, crosswalks, um, the traffic signal, new lighting, um, new pavement markings. So we're, we're you know, looking to transform the corridor, make it safer for pedestrians. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Mike. He's gonna touch on our median fencing initiatives. Thanks, Kyle. And uh, thank you, Dada, for allowing us to present today. Um, my name is Mike Steimer. I'm gonna share our progress on the median treatment project. The two highlighted ar areas represent uh, short-term focus areas and potential pilot projects that uh, the project team identified. The first location is from the 1340 split to 273, and the second location is near Wilmington University. The reason these locations were selected is because there's high pedestrian activity in the area, and other sections of 13 require additional improvements to be in place and coordination, coordination efforts complete prior to implementation. DelDOT is committed to implementing median treatment throughout the reigning US 13 corridor. Um, some of the improvements that need to be in, in place in order to accomplish this are signal improvements, intersection consolidation, uh, pedestrian facility upgrades, and there's coordinate, coordination that's ongoing with uh, businesses and agencies such as DRBA, FAA, uh, DART, and emergency services. 
So some discuss discussion topics that I want to touch on today is the median safety working group meeting, uh, a couple studies that show proven results, existing conditions and challenges out there along 13, treatments that we've considered, and what you can expect to see in the future. So just after the um, 2017 pedestrian council meeting, uh, we began working with Delta to establish a median safety working group meeting that consisted of representatives from a number of different Delta support sections and we began meeting on a monthly basis. One of the first action items of the committee was to identify temporary measures that we can implement immediately to help deter, deter pedestrians from making mid-block crossings. The committee decided to stop mowing operations within the median and let the grass grow tall. In the lower left-hand corner is a concept of this uh, approach. And if you drove down the 13 corridor in the fall, you noticed the grass was about knee high, about waist high for Kyle. <laughs> <My bad. laughs> um, the second action item of the committee was to identify major hurdles that would have to be overcome in order to successfully deliver the project. The committee ad identified two. The first is potential utility impacts. There's a number of utilities located within the median of 13, including Delmarva Gas, Artesian Water, uh, Delaware Pipeline, and a number of others. When I say utility impacts, I mean impacts associated with the footing foundation depth of the me median treatment that we select, as well as the alignment. Utilities need to have access to their facilities in the future for, for maintenance purposes, so we can't propose uh, median treatment directly over top of a facility for an extended period of time. <clears throat> Realizing that uh, utilities could be potentially an impact and a long lead item, we began utility coordinations immediately, immediately with the utility section. We have been and will continue to attend uh, DELDOT's monthly utility coordination meeting. We uh, worked with the utility section to begin subsurface utility explorations throughout the corridor. Uh, we already received quality level B designations for the 2019 paid in the rehab limits. Um, we're currently evaluating testimony needs for that project and we're getting ready to initiate uh, quality level B SU work for the remaining portion of the corridor. The second major hurdle that the committee identified was crash worthiness of the tested of the uh, median treatment. As you'll see in a few slides, some of the treatments that we've considered are crash tested. However, there's others, specifically decorative fencing, that we weren't sure whether it's a crash tested system. So we've reached out to neighboring state agencies as well as with the support of DCA, the contracting community, to try to find some crash testing information. We even held a, a decorative fencing vendor showcase meeting in November. Unfortunately, the weather wasn't the best, so some of the contractors weren't able to attend, but we had a face to face meeting with them to try to get some more background information. To date, we haven't been successful with finding crash test information for decorative fencing. That doesn't mean it's a deal breaker, it's just something we need to monitor. And we actually have a meeting with Federal Highway at the end of this month to, dis just to, <clears throat> excuse me, to discuss this topic. So a couple of studies that show proven results. The first is from New York DOT. Some of their representatives came down to Delaware in, I believe, 2016 to present at the Delaware Bike Ped Summit. The big takeaway from this is uh, early 90s, there was about 10 pedestrian fatalities per year. Through phased implementation of median treatments and other improvements and education enforcement, they were able to get their, that number down to zero in 2015 and 16. The next study is from Maryland State Highway Administration. The big takeaway from this study is that there was an 86% reduction in pedestrian and bicycle fatalities when median treatment was installed. The reason for that is uh, the treatments funnel pedestrians towards intersections, which is much lower vehicular speeds. Knowing that median treatments have proven to be effective, we started tracking treatment locations throughout the region to try to get a feel for the application type, you know, the treatment type, um, the ADT out there, the speed limits. Um, so we've been tracking a number of locations throughout the region. This is just a couple locations. The first is a US 40 in Frederick, Maryland. It has a very similar feel to US 13. There's also US 1 in uh, near University of Maryland, and then a Norfolk, uh, Virginia location. And we have our mystery location, which I was going to defer to Darren. I'll give you one guess where this location is. Softball, come on. There you go, you got it. <laughs> all right, so uh, existing conditions and challenges. So I already touched on utilities. You can see all the utilities that are in the median out there. There's also uh, an old uh, piecemealed storm drain system that's out there. So we're currently mapping that using archive plans and field observations. 
There's landscaping beds that are maintained by sponsoring organizations, so any modifications to those beds will require coordination efforts. There's guardrail out there that will be competing with space. There's a couple median breaks where uh, emergency vehicles use them exclusively, so any modifications to those require coordination effort. There's a number of interchange, interchanges, pedestrian overpasses, uh, ped poles, or not ped poles, light poles, and, uh, and signal poles that we just need to be aware of. And then the median itself, for the majority of the corridor, the median is a wide grass median, um, but there are locations where the median becomes narrower and, and is concrete. Some other considerations is location alignment. Obviously, I, I mentioned that previously, but we can't propose an alignment directly over top of existing utilities. <coughs> aesthetics, if possible, we want to try to improve the aesthetics of the corridor. Uh, maintenance, we want to ensure that we're proposing a treatment that's uh, minimal maintenance effort. Crashworthiness and footing depth I touched on, and then cost is obviously always a consideration for capital improvement jobs. So treatment that, that we have considered. Uh, guardrail, it's a crash-tested system. Height, the old standard's 27, new standard's 31 inches tall, um, but it's pretty easy to just step over a guardrail system. Uh, cable barrier, 39 inches tall, but you notice the gaps in between the cable strands. It is a crash-tested system, though. A uh, chain link fence, it's not a crash tested system. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing. Concrete barrier uh, is crash tested. The height can vary from 32 inches, 42 inches, even taller, um, but there's a cost associated with that. Concrete, concrete barrier with bracket mounted fence. Uh, the thought here is that you can get increased heights for a, low, for a lower cost. You don't have to pay for the concrete and the reinforcement. Vegetation, brush, landscaping, that's not necessarily preferred from a maintenance standpoint. Post and chain fence. This has been placed along sidewalks near University of Delaware and Delaware State. <coughs> Decorative fencing, which I touched on, it's not necessary, ne bleh, necessarily crash tested. Um, and it's normally about four to six feet tall. And then finally, a decorated fence with supplemental landscaping. So this is an existing photo of 13 uh, facing west, just east of the 1340 split. This photo showcases one of my favorite things as well. Trucks. I like trucks. Do you see them all? <laughs> this is a rendering of what 13 could look like if decorative fencing was placed in the median. So what you can expect to see, until we get a hard structure in place, uh, the grass will remain tall. We need to finalize mapping of the existing utilities and drainage system. And then we're proposing to advertise a pilot project which will consist of decorative fencing where there's wider grass medians and the less likelihood of an errant vehicle striking it. We'll propose concrete barrier with bracket mounted fence where the, where the median becomes narrower. And then to supplement that, where there's sufficient distances between commercial entrances, we'll propose post and chain along the sidewalks, along the outside shoulder, and veg, uh, low level vegetation where appropriate. Once the pilot project's in, in place, we'll evaluate the effectiveness of the median treatment, and then we'll uh, make corridor-wide you know, improvements. So the last topic we wanted to touch on is education enforcement. We're aware that uh, the Department and Office of Highway Safety have teamed in the past on pedestrian safety education enforcement campaigns. I want to emphasize that uh, the treatments that we just presented and that DELDOT's considering implementing are median deterrent, or pedestrian deterrent measures, deterrent being the key word. There's no guarantee that whatever treatment we place is going to stop all mid-block crossings. Uh, determined pedestrian may attempt and successfully bypass any treatment that we place out there. Um, so that's why we feel it's important to continue education enforcement campaigns to reinforce that uh, it's unsafe to cross at undesignated, undesignated locations. With that, um, we wanted to give a quick thank you to some of the key uh, project team members to help to get the project to where it is today. Um, we apologize if we left anyone lost off this list unintentionally, but it's been a, a real pleasure uh, working on such a high priority project and trying to find ways to help expedite the project delivery process. So with that, thank you for your time, and we will open the floor for questions.